Suzanne Wolf. That would be it's me. a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we are uh, attempting to gather the history of ICANN. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions and then we okay. will be up and running. The first question is the easy one. Okay. Talk about your, uh, how you got involved in ICANN, what the time frames were, what your roles were, uh, and that will give us a baseline that we can work from. From then to now? Well, it's going to be kind of, it's going to take a few minutes. Do it. So my involvement with ICANN predates ICANN. Mm -hmm. And that always provides a unique moment when I have to introduce myself and talk about ICANN. Um, I became involved with ICANN because I was working at the time for John Postel, mm -hmm. University of Southern California, ISI, wonderful place. Still miss the, the, mm -hmm. the environment there. Still have friends I made there. Um, but when ICANN had to come about, new co, a new home for the IANA functions, there was a great deal of political and social and economic, you know, people were talking about all kinds of things. I'm a techie. I was a system administrator and a network operator in the research group that the Postel ran. Um, I worked with the networking guys out of all the groups at ISI because they were doing the cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was technical and, and, you know, I did, looked after name servers and did a lot of, 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 of the day-to-day -day work that supported IANA. And at a certain point as the drama unfolded around us, I was in a conversation with him and some of the other folks that worked on IANA, and he turned to me and said, you realize that when all the yelling is over, somebody is gonna have to be in the middle of things making sure that the systems actually run and people can do their work. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was, sounded like an interesting task of making the operational and technical side of ICANN actually happen. So I agreed to do that. I said, okay, you know, as we're planning the office, as we're doing the mundane things that go into making sure the operation works, sign me up for that. So when ICANN started as a separate organization, they had office space that was sublet to them at, by USC in the building that USC is still in, you know, mm -hmm. ISI is still in. And I was the one that did everything to make the bits flow. Everything to make the, I had the, you know, everything from getting the phone system installed to procuring and setting up the servers that the IANA staff needed to work on. Mm -hmm. And it was a couple of the IANA folks and me and Mike Roberts, who is the CEO, and in all seriousness, a couple of lawyers. Um, and very small number of people, very small, very shoestring resources. Um, the board was much larger than the staff. Um, and uh, there was a lot, well, Mike and the board were doing all of the big picture stuff to make ICANN viable and get through those initial difficult days. Um, there were a couple of us back at the office making sure that IANA, which is what it was all supposed to be about, was actually able to function. Mm -hmm. Um, as you've uh, implied, you were at uh, ISI and as ICANN was formed and uh, that function was moved from ISI to ICANN, you moved with it. I, I did um, for only a couple of years it turned out and ICANN didn't have a payroll capacity at that point that could, um, in fact I was loaned by USA. I've never been an ICANN employee. Uh -huh. um, so that's an interesting uh, detail, but let me ask, were there others who uh, were in the same position who either moved or were loaned by ISI? Yeah, there were, um, wow, I would have to go look at, I would have to make sure that I knew the names, but there were a couple of the IANA staff. Um, Josh Elliott, I remember most clearly, I believe there was another staffer, and I am embarrassed I've forgotten the names, but there was really a very short, it was a very small number of people. Yeah. And in fact, we used to try to imagine what would happen when things were stable and we really knew what ICANN was going to be like. And oh, right. not that much it was, bigger than it was then. It's hard to see. It that was powerful. hard to see it growing to be a tenth of the size it is now. Yeah. And um, it would be interesting to know what happened to those people, just as a curiosity. Um, and how long were you in that role, and then what happened uh, because uh, you? went off to do some other things? Well, the whole thing fell apart without me. 
I was there until the early 2001 because I, I went through the Y2K, which oh. of course was f was filled with great drama, partly because I can was I can, and partly because you know with all of the IANA functions and so on, but also partly because there were a great many of fears that turned out to be somewhat overblown, but obviously needed attention um, attached to the root name servers. Mm. So there was a large ongoing project that had to do with making sure that the um, the worldwide DNS, the root name servers, the, the functionality they depended on was uh, reliable and stable through the Y2K drama. Um, early 2001 though, um, I figured I've been doing this for a while um, and I went to Bay Area um, networking company and after that to ISC which is well known as the open source company that provides a lot of network infrastructure software. So I was working on DNS again. Yeah, bind, bind in particular. Bind, bind many generations yeah, though, ago, yeah. ago then, but I was, at, I was actually at ISC for quite some years through many versions of Bind, through many revolutions in how the network operates, what people expected of their software, what people expected of the structures around the software yeah. and the corporate, you know, how the industry grew and changed and so on. And I haven't been with ISC for the, last for the last couple of years, but one of the things that happened while I was at ISC was ICANN reorganized. It's, I, ISC is also a root name server operator and was part of a set of events. Um, ICANN reorganized in, I believe it was 2003. You would remember yes. better than I because I was somewhat disconnected at that point. But there was a reorganization around ICANN of how the board was structured and how governance of the corporation was structured and, and a great many changes around how the community was integrated with the organization. And one of the things that happened was the Root Server System Advisory Committee that I participated in was asked to send a liaison to the ICANN Board of Directors. Right. And I was asked to take that on. Um, partly because when I was at ICANN, one of the things I did was get RSAC started. Oh. I ran the first meeting of the root server operators that became RSAC because it was considered important for ICANN to make a relationship to make relationships with the root server operators. Mm -hmm. It wasn't clear to anybody exactly how that should work, but it mattered to ICANN, it mattered to the community, it mattered to the U.S. government that there be something, and that was what RSAC was. Interesting. So you you got RSAC started while you were at ICANN, mm -hmm. and you went to uh, uh, to ISC, which was a root operator, mm -hmm. and uh, became reinvolved in some sense with got ICANN. Got dragged back in. Uh, now, if if memory serves, I may be wrong, but weren't you also one of the charter members of SSEC? I was not a charter member of SSEC. I was drawn in um, after a particular incident involving. Um, the Verisign.com wildcard. Oh. And I had been involved in ISC's response to analyzing what happened there, and a great many people were extremely angry about that incident. And one of the things that came out of it was some response by ISC as a software vendor and an operator of DNS infrastructure. Um, and I believe that, and that turned into some conversations because that was something SAC was looking closely at. That turned into an invitation to participate in those conversations. I see. And from there, I was invited to, as a member. I see. So just very quickly, uh, I, of course, was uh, chair of SAC from mm -hmm. its beginning in uh, early 2002. The event that you're referring to is extremely famous and is a pivotal point in our lives and everybody else's. <laughs> September 15th, 2003, just to be specific. I, I, and, I, <laughs> I wouldn't uh, even have been able to tell you it was 2003. Uh, 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 a, a moment that will live in my memory for quite some time. Um, we had a pretty interesting day at ISC that day too. Uh, it was it was an interesting. It was a Sunday afternoon, and it was um, um, that's time. We don't have time to even begin to. We'll go to that in, we'll some other day. That day. But uh, uh, as you as you mentioned, there was a reorg, a reorganization. Um, there's another term of art that was being used, but anyway, the bylaws were changed. Um, the advisory committees. SSAC for one, RSAC for another, and so forth. Uh, positions were created on the board for liaisons from uh, 
those organizations. You became the liaison from RSAC. Right. Uh, uh, there was a lack of interest within SSAC, uh, which I decided I should go fill for, right. uh, not so much for ambition, but because it would help position SSAC more visibly inside the board. And so I, I double-hatted myself as both chair and liaison. Right. So we joined the board in the same, in parallel same, yeah. positions at the same time. Um, That's right. Somewhere along the way in 2003, summertime or fall or whatever that was. Um, you were there ahead of me, but not by very long. As I um, well, um, so we've had a long, uh, a long march together. It's been, uh, it's been pretty interesting. Um, so that's. So that's the uh, sort of rough history. That's question it's one. The outline. Question yeah. two, and there's many pieces to this. Okay. Uh, uh, what's most interesting is to get at the underlying story, the why and the how of things happen, not just the what, when, and where, and who. Right. Pick out, and if you have trouble picking out, I'll help you out. <laughs> um, particular sequences or stories. Uh, that put the pieces together and relate uh, events over a period of time that help explain uh, and inform where we are today so that if you imagine somebody sitting in your seat today on the board or working for ICANN and trying to figure out why is it that these things are the way they are, either relationships or structures or whatever, that uh, there's a story to tell that says, well, it came about in the following way. <laughs> I'll ask you for a prompt, and then I'll decide if I'll use it or, the fir or I'll use the first thing that came to mind. Uh, well, you, you triggered one when you said something about uh, there was an issue about the root servers and they needed to be organized, which reminded me that there was a singular event mm -hmm. that took place a few years earlier, which uh, you were probably part of, that led to the creation of ICANN, which was uh, a small reorganization of the addresses for some of the root servers, uh, for which Ira Magaziner said he woke up the president. I've heard that side of the story. I can't vouch for it. No, nor can I. But uh, there are a great many people involved in these policy and political arguments over this. But what was really going on was there was an operational function of deciding updates to the root, to the root zone of the DNS, what names were valid for domain names in the DNS, that had been treated up until then as a strictly operational matter, which Postel, in consultation with other stakeholders, we didn't call them that then, would made these decisions in a very informal way because the other people involved in operational responsibility for those matters trusted Ayanna. Mm -hmm. He worked closely with the IETF, which is the standards body, was, still is, um, worked closely with, those, with the root server operators and with other constituents. But it was all very informal. And as one aspect of how the political story was unfolding, as people were saying, this doesn't work, you know, this isn't going to scale. Um, there was a, an occasion where, as, a, as an experiment, there was an occasion where some of the root server operators were asked to change the source they used for the root zone data. This was very alarming to the, politi the political people, the policy people, because it, was a, it, it, it uncovered a power structure they didn't know about and didn't know how to deal with, right. which was personal relationships based on, gee, things will break if we don't play well together, right. so we'll play well together. But this wasn't computing. And in fairness, this had not exactly been explained to them very well. Uh -huh. So it's no mystery to me that there was a great deal of alarm. But what came out of that was after a, the heart attacks were, were, were taken care of, the immediate reaction, what came out of it was an assertion by the United States government that really nobody should change the root zone of the DNS without their express permission. Mm. That was a big change, even though at that time the root zone did not change very often. Mm -hmm. It was not dynamic. We had a few TLDs. It seemed to be working that way. The country codes were being delegated. There were a few what's now called GTLDs. It wasn't a big operational drama to, to manage the root zone. But it was kind of important, and this hadn't been Clearly hadn't housed a lot in, of visibility yet. Well, but it also hadn't been carefully housed in any kind of institutional right, arrangement. Right. So 
there was this immediate felt pressure to create a structure, which mm -hmm. was, don't change that unless the United States government says so. And then to say, that's not going to work in the long term either. That's not going to scale to the enormous expansion of the internet and the interests that people have right. in the internet. So we got to figure out something else. And that's largely how the policy side of ICANN came about. Now, uh, something that is so obvious to you and me but needs to be said mm -hmm. is that uh, the a large number of the parties involved are these CCTLD operators right. who were then became very dependent upon the IANA function. But the other obvious comment is each one of them got was started by in by Postel awarding them right. they were, the, the letter, the right. uh, the the the, 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 um, the code. Uh, so there was a direct personal relationship that was very positive in the sense that th these were his progeny in a sense. They were, and the, those personal relationships, uh, both with the root server operators and with the TLD uh, yeah. delegate yeah. operators, um, and it was actually extremely unfortunate. It was, it was a formative event yeah. also when, when he passed. Right. Because he didn't get the chance, even though that was the plan, he didn't get the chance to do the personal work of turning his personal relationships right. into institutional ones. Right. And there was a great deal of trouble and, and discomfort and distrust that followed from the fact that he wasn't able to, to be part of that process. Because there was a certain amount of, I can, what's that? And you guys, who are you and why should I listen to you? Well, so let me ask a, 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 a kind of provocative question here. Uh, so it's extremely unfortunate, no question, mm -hmm. that John passed away uh, sort of on the eve of the formal uh, start of ICANN. Right. Uh, so that's an event heard around the world and everybody knows that that's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could imagine some alternate uh, thing, sequences. It could have happened that others uh, could have stepped in and uh, uh, made the rounds to uh, assure everybody that uh, John-like people uh, would be in charge and that the relationships would continue and uh, uh, attend to the relationships and the trust. Um, that is a little bit provocative because from what I saw, there was a certain amount of effort to do that. Mm -hmm. Some of it was actually effective. We did end up, for example, with um, an agreement between ICANN and the IETF and a different set of agreements between ICANN and the regional internet registries that said, yeah, we'll continue to work with you. Yeah. Which frankly, as far as I'm concerned, is a success of what of the work that was done of the kind you're describing. Because there was a while Good. where it was not at all clear. Who, who were the prime um, movers on the I, ICANN side uh, of things for that? I actually had limited visibility on that. There were a few of the senior engineering folks that had been involved with Postel, principally through the IETF, mm -hmm. and IANA, and RFC editor, and so on. Um, Fred Baker, John Clemson, um, I'm trying to remember who were the other All right. contacts there. But there were several of, of, of those. I've never, I never focused on it, and I wasn't around at that particular time. So, uh, But it Vint, never... Vint was, was, I believe, instrumental in a great uh, deal of this. But some of it was tried with some success, yeah. frankly. The whole yeah. thing didn't fly apart. Yeah. And to me, that's a success. Um, there was some of it that was tried, but the situation had arisen that there was a deliberate effort to select people to be closely involved with ICANN who did not come from the community, who were not familiar with John and his, insti and his personal relationships, his institutional relationships, how the internet worked. So some people tried very earnestly to do what you described. and. It didn't always go very well. And there was also, for political and policy reasons, I'm not the person to speak to authoritatively, a great deal of discomfort and distrust had been generated by the process of trying to decide among all these constituents how ICANN would be set up and who would, who would run it. The white paper process, the I green see. paper process. Oh, and so there was, by the time we had that work to do, there were not a lot of resources available to help uh -huh. them. 
So I was carefully not participating and don't uh, have all that, but that's certainly an area that has to be delved into very deeply right. as setting the context pro and con for how ICANN got kicked off and uh, what, what baggage came with it. Well, and, and, and for me, I look at this thing, I was distant from those processes. Yeah. And my role then and frankly now has to do with saying, okay, it's important to support the policy processes and these right. institutional processes right. and so on, but real, what really matters is to keep things connected enough that the internet works. Mm -hmm. And it certainly would have been easy to become very confused about the relationship between some of the policy and institutional activities yeah. at that time and anything to do with keeping the internet functioning. And, and uh, what about the CC TLD operators? Uh, to what extent, I, I mean, uh, I'm flashing back to uh, what little I know about the uh, um, contentious process of the green paper, the white paper, and all the different groups involved, but I don't have the impression that there were a lot of CCTLD operators uh, directly involved in that process. I may be wrong. No, I, I, from what I saw of it, there weren't very many that were involved on the policy side. Yeah. For most of them, at that time, the CCTLD operators were the people that Postel had picked in many, many countries at a time when the internet was a new thing, right. was not to the attention of governments, right. certainly was not part of their sovereign heritage, right. that there was a TLD as part of, you know. Yeah. This was not critical infrastructure yet. So what you had was mo many of the TLD operators were either technologists who happened to have access to network resources, right. because that was what was important in Postel's criteria, or were just emerging past that. Right. We're beginning to say this is critical infrastructure, this is commercially important, let's run it in a more institutional right. way. But there was a, it was very early in that process for most of the, the CCTLDs. Um, I'll just note that we have two uh, that I can think of quickly of the original CCTLD operators uh, closely associated with ICANN, uh, Lido Ibera, mm -hmm. uh, El Salvador, and uh, Adiel uh, Ekpogan, uh, African I'm going to get it wrong, which country, Togo, I think, or, um, I think so. uh, and um, so there's deep history to still uh, part of what we do today, um, which is kind of amazing. Many of the people that were involved in building these, inst these, in these infrastructures then have gone on to other things. Mm -hmm. Many have become uncomfortable with how things have evolved, mm -hmm. but many have stayed involved mm -hmm. and stayed committed to making the internet work better. Mm -hmm. You know, now that we're talking about the next billion, when then right. we were talking about the next million right. or the next ten million. Right. Um, I think we're actually very fortunate that there there have been there are so many people with the deep history. Um, a lot of them are skeptical of ICANN, frankly. Mm -hmm. Not all of them are very comfortable with something like this meeting, but um, we actually have a lot of them still are gone, and I think that's tremendous. All right. Any so, more provocative questions? So that was a provocative question. I don't know whether we plumbed the full depth of it, but they got, uh, <laughs> got some interesting things out. Um, what came to mind first? Uh, uh, was it that or was something else uh, when you asked me to? Uh, well, it, that's an easy one from the the beginning sort of days, yeah. but in many ways with the IANA transition process of the last couple of years, it's been feeling like we've come full circle. And there were a great many, I would say, community tensions around some of the history, some of the early history, frankly, that has resurfaced in the context of having to work out yeah. a shared proposal. Uh -huh. for the IANA stewardship transition. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, this is exactly how it was always supposed to be. Maybe it's taken longer than people initially thought it would. But the idea would be that the community would figure out its challenges and figure out a way to work together and would be able to move beyond the U.S. government contract and the U.S. government stewardship oversight. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I think people had to face some of the things that have been lingering, if you will, since that early history. And so, that's been fascinating to watch. So uh, let's not leave, the, leave that hanging. Say specifically, what are some of those things that were lingering? Uh. 
this is challenging to articulate because I've been living it so much for the last I couple understand. of years. And I, 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 and I know you have too. And, and, and once I get started, maybe you can help me articulate a little bit. There's always been a tension and for some people it goes back to the way the internet works, to some people it goes back to the policy and political history, but regardless of where it came from, there's always been a certain tension about the idea that all of these constituencies work together and that the stakeholders, if you will, are part of an interdependent system and the notion that someone's in charge. Mm -hmm. And As one formulation of the principle, the internet is founded technologically and to a great extent institutionally on the assumption that local decisions are made locally, mm -hmm. that what the internet is for is interoperation yep. and coordination. It's not an end in itself and right. it's not a structure for control by itself. Mm -hmm. And that creates some real challenges around who's in charge of what and who makes decisions and how do decisions get made, particularly in situations where decisions must be made. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the entire, at one level, the entire history of ICANN, particularly these last couple of years, have been about figuring out how much do we need somebody to make decisions and how much do we need to make sure we don't have anybody in charge. Mm -hmm. So there's been, certainly the, the with the community proposal, a great deal of the discussion about it that led to the, the proposal was based on working out under what circumstances, you know, who's in, how are decisions made? Not even who makes decisions so much as how are they made? Mm -hmm. Who are the stakeholders who have to be in the room? Mm -hmm. What are the structures whereby these, these contentions have to be worked out? And it's been really interesting to watch. Um, but I, I have to say I'm more ha I'm happier than I expected to be with the outcome of that entire process, as painful as it was, because I think some of those lingering discomforts about really at one level what is I can in charge of, mm -hmm. and what are some of the other stakeholders actually in charge of. Mm -hmm. um, I think we actually worked out some of them in a way that I think will we'll be good to go forward with. Today, in addition to all the things we've talked about. You're also uh, heavily involved with the IETF and IAB, mm -hmm. and uh, which means you're um, engaged in specific technical issues that relate directly back to issues that affect ICANN, right. but from a technical development point of view. Say a word about that and where that's all leading and what the unsolved problems are that uh, would required the action that's now underway? Well, what I do, I'm currently a member of the Internet Architecture Board, where part of what we do is some administrative management of the ITF's relationships with other groups. Sure. But what we're really supposed to be doing is taking the big picture view of how the Internet Architecture is evolving, not just in the IETF, but in, in other standards bodies and other ways of doing right. technology in the industry and so on and so forth. Right. I also co-chair the DNS operations working group of the IETF, which is where people, where DNS operators and people involved with operating DNS infrastructure bring changes they need, think need to be made. And uh, most of what DNS operations does is actually best practices and documenting yep. some of the things people are doing with the technology. Some of them are not what was originally envisioned as how it would work, and that by itself is a challenge. Sure evolving how stuff works. What are the current uh, 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 documents or uh, designs that are active in the DNS op working group? Oh my. That sounds like you're looking for something in particular. Can I ask you for... Well, uh, it's, it, uh, it, I'm just uh, trying to drive down the path that I described before, which is uh, f based on whatever you say, um, to what extent how would that relate to what, what came before and why are those still open problems and how does it relate to uh, what's happening at ICANN? And I don't have the answers in my head, so I'm... I, I'm there's probably a couple of... No, okay, so there's a couple of things that, that we can talk about. Um, for one thing, the way DNS is designed, there's this dependency on root name servers. Mm. It's a bootstrapping mechanism. It's yes. an optimization. From a protocol perspective, 
it's not a very, it, it, with, with due respect to, to our good friend, Dr. Manka Petras, um, that's not necessarily the best way to bootstrap any technical system, uh -huh. is to have pre-configured yep. contact points with how you Seemed make like it work. Seemed like a good idea at the time. It did, and it was, <laughs> but having the system work really, really well isn't necessarily a reason not to evolve past yeah. that. So we have some ongoing efforts to come up with best practices and ways of replicating the root data in a way that depends less on a specific set of servers. Interesting. Um, and this is all purely technical practice, and it's not about the data in the root zone. It's about replicating, not changing, but on a wider basis yep. than necessarily yep. from the root name servers. Yep. Um, there are many efforts to refine how DNSSEC works in practice because the ability to authenticate DNS data because of all the things you can carry in DNS, mm -hmm. the ability to authenticate a DNS answer is really important. It allows you to do all kinds of other things in a more Indeed. trustworthy way. Indeed. But it's also very difficult to do operationally. So we're still refining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many years after the base specification was done and people have been trying to deploy. And as you know, I spent a good fraction of my life uh, pushing all that, so I'm very empathetic. And part of what has to be done there is operators have to do, and this is a very internet thing, this yeah. is right, but because there, there's all the interlocking pieces. Yeah. ICANN has to help people come up with good ways of doing it, has to sort of nudge people sometimes in some of the relationships ICANN has, but also the standards and technology people have to do what they can for operators to do the right thing day to day. So it all interlocks. And I believe, and I never get to see, there's always a DNSSEC day at ICANN meetings, and I never get to see. Hey, I, I initiated those <laughs> and ran those, and I had to gradually back out and then finally give up, and uh, so I'm very, very I empathetic. But the, but the, I never get to do techie things at yeah, ICANN meetings. Well, I'm too busy uh, doing uh, policy things. The sadness is your time on the board as the uh, RSAC uh, liaison, I gather, is coming to an end. Most likely. Yes, um, it's been a role I've been in for a long time, and I've enjoyed it. I feel like I've done some good work there, but also one of the things that's happened is that RSAC has matured. The root server operators are stepping into more of a role in the community, and I'm actually pretty pleased with them. That they've gotten to the point where they're willing to have, come up with a process and a plan for replacing And, and uh, I hadn't quite realized your pivotal role or your seminal role in getting RSAC started, so I can well imagine that you are indeed uh, it's very, challenging. very pleased to see the maturity level. But you, you, you said most likely as opposed to certainly. So is there a glimmer of hope that the... <laughs> I don't expect to be on the board past the, the AGM. The most likely is because one of the, one of the, the work of, part of the work of RSAC at this meeting is to take the next steps towards yeah. finalizing their process and, and determining how to run it. But the good news is that then you can go to technical meetings and, and do technical <laughs> I look forward to that. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to, to swing back to the, uh, to the IETF uh, sure. working group um, and, and just flag uh, the point that uh, one, one thing you focused on was uh, the uh, priming process for or the bootstrap process, as you right. said, for root servers. And um, I had not focused on that, but I understand that I know a lot about the details of how it currently works and what those issues are. Um, and so there's a long, long history that's been very stable for a long time, and now you say it's being re-examined as to how to do that. Um, and what are the main drivers that uh, are causing people to feel the need to push on that? There's a couple of pieces. It's, there's always the drive to make the, to, to make the network work better. And in the, it, the tension for DNS and for the, the root is that it's a global resource. Yes. It has to be globally available. Yes. And anything global makes network people want to optimize it down to something local. Yeah. So there's the Anycast um, technique the root server operators and any DN many, many DNS operators and operators of other network services yep. use to make sure that many, many servers can provide the same service under the same configuration. Right. But there's also the notion that for any network operator, if you want to make a local copy of the root, 
that is available to your users. Yeah. There should be a well, and there are failure modes of that. It's challenging. Yeah. So, there, so there was a need for best practices on uh -huh. how to do that effectively. Uh -huh. And then the DNSSEC was the other thing you mentioned, and there. I don't think we'd have any trouble uh, documenting what the uh, needs are because uh, we've been tracking that for years. And, uh, well, it's uh, certainly so, a significant challenge to get DNSSEC and to, to get a signed root zone and to get all of the, the policy pieces and the operational pieces and the, the, the You just details. said a keyword, uh, and I'm going to, and I see we've got a couple of minutes, but not long. <laughs> the root was signed in 2010. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you and I both know, it was not a trivial, uh, easy uh, decision or process or anything. Uh, say well, something about, about the events leading up to the signing of the root zone from where you were sitting. There were two pieces. One was fast and one was slow. The slow part was an, eff an effort literally over several years to persuade the stakeholders that the technology was ready to deploy. Yes that we weren't going to make DNS actually work less well mm -hmm. for users, that there was benefit to it that would justify the expense. Yes. Because there was significant expense involved in getting the security yeah. apparatus and processes in place. Yes. But the other thing that occurred, and there were lengthy discussions that were leading in that direction, um, and it was a long, it was frankly a, a long process of just, because, we, making a significant change to how the root zone is generated and, and distributed, yep. Yep. people were worried about that, frankly, yep. justifiably. Network people like to sleep through the night and not be patient to in the morning because yep. something broke. But also, there was a discovery as people were sort of taking pretty much unbounded time to decide whether this was a good idea. There was a specific issue that arose where there was basically a bug in the way DNS was deployed pretty much worldwide where it was possible, it became po trivially possible, easily possible for a teenager in a, the basement that knew basic, you know, ba a little bit of programming to create a situation where they could lie about DNS data, yeah. that they could redirect legitimate traffic by lying about DNS data. And this became the push that convinced people that we needed and, to use and DNSSEC. And to fill in the blanks there, um, DNSSEC was invented to provide strong assurance that the data that you received is the data that was intended to be received using cryptographic signatures. Uh, from the time that that work started a decade earlier or more uh, in the 90, early 90s, uh, other mitigating me measures were put mm -hmm. into place that reduced the chance right. and made it harder to spoof the data. And the event that you're talking about was Kaminsky discovering that those uh, mitigating uh, uh, mitigations weren't actually effective and could be bypassed that it was much trivially. Much easier. The thing that, that Dan discovered um, was that it was much easier. Yes. Because he's a very smart mathematical guy. That it was much easier to intercept. Right. Intercept the query and send a lie back. Yeah. And what the NSEC did was is. It, basically assured that you would at least be able to tell yeah. if you were being lied to. And, and, and all of a sudden that caused a big shift in the understanding of, yes, this is an important problem, we better get this fixed. What it changed was the perception of the cost of getting it wrong. Yeah, cost of getting it wrong, yeah. Um, right. And the cost of doing nothing. Right. Which so many of these things come down to that though, what's really the cost of doing yeah. nothing. I see that we have come to a, a moment when we need to I pause. I think we do. And, uh, but this is, I think we got a lot of good stuff on so the far. table so far. Awesome. More to come. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Yeah.